would do today would be just to give you a general introduction to uh, my version of food politics. And I come at this from um, the viewpoint of an academic who deals with food systems. And by food systems, my particular version of that is uh, everything from about food from production to consumption, agriculture, food, nutrition, and public health. Um, I'm trained in public health and nutrition, and I kind of look at it from that point of view. And I, for a long time, I kind of didn't get what agriculture had to do with what people eat. It took me a long time to figure that out. Um, and now I think you can't understand anything about why people eat the way they do unless you understand the way the food system works. And I talk about a lot of this in my books. This is a commercial. Um, this is the uh, new edition of my, of my book, Food Politics, which came out uh, in, originally in 2002 and is now in a 10th anniversary edition, even though it's 11 years. Um, but its publication has given me the opportunity to look back to see what has happened in the last 10 years in food systems, and a lot has happened, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, if you look at global food issues for um, the, the kinds of things that we're looking at right now, from agriculture to food to nutrition and public health, uh, the two big ones are, ironically, uh, not enough food so that people have what is now called food insecurity, and too much food, which is causing people to be overweight and obese and have the problems that go with that. And these are linked by two factors. They're linked by the solutions, which where there's a real conflict between whether you talk about these the solutions to these problems as problems of personal responsibility, or whether you talk about them as problems that society needs to work with. Uh, on, and I would argue that they're societal problems. And we're at a very, very exciting time in food politics today. Um, just now, I heard that Congress passed the immigration bill. Um, these are the people who pick our vegetables. Um, so that's a part of food politics. And this morning, the Department of Agriculture announced that it had finally released the nutri nutri nu nutritional guidelines for competitive school for competitive foods in school meals. These are the foods that are served outside the school lunch, um, the formerly junk foods that are in vending machines and sold a la carte um, and served at ball games and things like that. Um, so that's pretty exciting development. And last week, the American Medical Association uh, recognized obesity as a disease. Uh, we can argue about whether it's a disease or a risk factor, but the importance of the Medical Association recognizing it is that it's now on the way to being reimbursable, which means that doctors might actually ask their patients about uh, what they eat and how they eat and maybe get involved in doing something about it. That would be really terrific. Um, what links obesity with food insecurity um, is that both are related to poverty. Rates of obesity are much higher among people who are poor, and obviously uh, food insecurity is higher among people who are poor. I'm not going to say very much about food insecurity, except to remind everybody that it's going up. Um, the arrow points to the economic downturn of 2008, and there was a sharp uptick in rates of um, what are of food insecurity, not having enough food on a reliable basis from day to day, and a fifth of the people in the United States uh, fall into that category, 10% of children and 1% of children in the United States, one out of 100, are considered to be severely food insecure and are actually hungry from day to day. And if you want to know more about that, there's a movie called Place at the Table, and I highly recommend it um, as a way of describing what some of the problems are. Now, the Department of Agriculture has put out a report just a couple, just a couple months ago, last month, on food insecurity in households with children, in which they talk about the highest levels of food insecurity, of worrying about where the next meal is coming from, are in families with the lowest income, who are the least educated, the most unemployed, the most disabled, have the most number of children, and have no federal 
benefits. And the no federal benefits part brings us immediately to another aspect of food politics, which is the Farm Bill. And you're going to be very grateful. I'm not going to talk about the Farm Bill in this talk, uh, except to say that the House uh, last week or the week before uh, failed to pass it. And it's now a complete mess. The elephant in the, in the farm bill is SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, food stamps, which is the main lifeline for people who don't have enough money to buy food. Um, and it's probably going to be okay because it's got a continuing resolution. Um, but the whole farm bill political situation around it and uh, SNAP are a mess. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Um, to fix domestic and world hunger, looking at it from the standpoint of agriculture to public health, obviously world hunger is a, hunger is a worldwide problem, much more than a domestic one. And we know what it is that, that we have to do in order to fix problems on a worldwide basis. We encourage mothers to breastfeed. Um, we arrange so, arrange it so that people have access to clean water and safe food. You have to empower women, educate everybody. Sustainable agriculture helps a lot, um, and it's nice to have a, political, a politically stable uh, situation where you don't have war and you have a government that's actually interested in taking care of its people. And then income equity. And the two that I have here in yellow, uh, education and income equity, are the two that apply both to worldwide problems of uh, hunger and malnutrition and domestic. And the, what links all of these factors together is that these are social solutions to the problem of uh, not enough food. If you want to fix it, you've got to change society in ways that are going to educate people, provide income equity, um, and provide political stability. And so this is much more than personal responsibility. It really is a, a, a responsibility of society. Well, what I'm going to focus on as uh, the basis of a lot of the discussion today is um, the obesity problem, because the politics of obesity bring in a lot of these themes and issues. And we know uh, from many, many surveys that rates of obesity in the United States were constant for decades and didn't really begin to increase until the early 1980s. And we know what caused it. Uh, people started eating bigger hamburgers. It was as simple as that. Um, and we also know what to do about it. If you want to do something about obesity, you have to eat less, you have to eat better, you need to move more. And please don't eat my book. Um, but if it seems more complicated than that, and I really think it's this simple, if it seems more complicated than that, it's surely because of the effective advice to eat less on the food industry. And this was made most obvious to me in 2007 when an executive of Coca-Cola gave an interview to, to Advertising Age in which she said, our Achilles heel is obesity. It used to be, we didn't have to pay any attention to it. We could just say, we're not forcing you to eat our products or drink our products. Um, it's up to you to decide what you're going to drink. And now it's this enormous global issue that just makes it impossible to market our products in any reasonable way. Well, that was in 2007. At the end of 2012, um, every, uh, every publicly traded corporation must file a report with the Security and Exchange Commission. And the Security and Exchange Commission requires companies to talk about and to disclose the issues that might have an effect on their bottom line negatively. And Coca-Cola in December 30, in December 2012, listed as the most important factor that might affect its bottom line concerns about obesity. Um, obesity, it said, may reduce demand. Uh, consumers, public health people, and government officials are really concerned about it, particularly as it affects children. Uh, and then it goes on and on and on to talk about all the things that people are doing to try to to reduce soda, to get people to reduce soda consumption. 
So the food industry is uh, having a hard time with this, and I kind of want to talk about why and some of the reasons why this is uh, so hard on the food industry. So let's go back to the early 1980s when rates of obesity started to rise and ask the obvious question, what happened in the early 1980s that made people either move less or eat more? Um, and let's look first at the physical activity part of it. Although it might seem obvious that people are less active now than they were in 1980, as this cartoon suggests, in fact, the data show something quite different. Um, we don't, I don't want to push this too hard because the data on physical activity, if anything, are worse than the data on uh, dietary intake. But as far as we can tell, um, activity in 1980 and 2005, if anything, it increased a little, and inactivity from a different survey decreased a little. I don't want to push this. So let's just say there's not a whole lot of evidence that rates of physical activity have changed very much since 1980. In contrast, there is vast amounts of research that indicates that people are eating more. Uh, and there are two main lines of evidence for that. One is the number of calories in the food supply, uh, which have gone up from 3,200 per person. That's man, woman, little tiny baby, 3,200 a day. It's now 3,900, an increase of 700 calories. That's not what people are actually eating. These are the calories that are available. That is what's produced in this country, less exports plus imports, divided by the number of people in the population. Um, but 3,900 calories is roughly twice average need when you count little tiny babies and that. Um, when you ask people what they eat, they lie. Um, but even so, if you assume that people lie as much now as they did in the 1980s, uh, it's, people are still reporting an increase of about 200 calories a day. So I don't know what the real number is. It's probably somewhere between 200 and 700. But whatever it is, people are eating more. So the obvious question is, how come? Why are people eating more now than they did in the 1980s? And I think the answer to that question is deregulation. And three kinds of deregulation. The first was of agriculture supports so that instead of paying farmers to conserve their land and not grow food, uh, they paid farmers to grow as much food as they possibly could. Farmers are really good at doing what they're paid for. Um, and the result was mountains of corn in a sea of farm subsidies. And that's why the number of calories in the food supply increased. A second form of deregulation, oddly enough, was of Wall Street. Uh, in the early 1980s, there was a movement called the shareholder value movement in which shareholders complained that blue, chip, that blue chip stocks were a bore and the long, slow return on investment that blue chip stocks gave uh, was not very good for investors. Investors wanted higher returns on investment immediately. And the result of that was tough on all corporations, but it was particularly tough on food corporations who were already trying to sell their products in an environment in which there were twice as many calories available as anybody needed. Now they not only had to sell their products, but they had to grow their sales every 90 days and report growth to Wall Street every 90 days. And you see the results of that in the sharp um, focus of Wall Street on what food corporations are doing. They, every quarter there's a flurry of um, McDonald's is in trouble or Pepsi sales are down or whatever up or down, whatever they are, they're heavily scrutinized. Um, so, corporate, so food corporations had a hard time selling in this very competitive environment and growing in this very competitive environment, um, but Congress made it a little easy for, easier for them by deregulating marketing, um, a lot of food marketing and particularly deregulating marketing to children. So the amount of money that went into marketing went up um, very precipitously starting in the early 1980s. So this created a situation in which food companies had to sell a lot of food very fast and they were going to market it. So let me just say a word about marketing. 
um, advertising age every year comes out with a compendium of how much e uh, the top the leading corporations spend on advertising. And this is just advertising that goes through advertising agencies so it can be measured. It's very difficult to get advertising budgets for specific products, but Advertising Age discloses a few of those. And their most recent one came out three days ago. Um, and these are some of the numbers. So uh, the advertising budget for Coca-Cola, that's Coca-Cola Classic, the only Coca-Cola, that's the only one that, that has this budget, $243 million. Uh, Gatorade, Pepsi spends $101 million a year on it. $26 million for Cheez-Its. 35 for Cinnamon Toast Crunch, 33 for Pop-Tarts, and my favorite is $82 million a year to advertise Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Um, these numbers are almost incomprehensible. In total, the food industry spends about $17 billion on advertising that goes through advertising agencies, and probably twice as much on other forms of advertising that don't go through. Um, advertising agencies like trade shows and um, gifts to nutrition organizations and things like that. Um, another way, thing that got deregulated was marketing, and so products were able to put health claims and nutrition claims on their products, um, and this is one of my favorite. I just think it's really cute. Um, what we know about these kinds of things is that they sell food products really, really well. And there's now a growing body of research that shows that any kind of health claim on a food product makes people think that it doesn't have any calories. Um, so if a, an organic label, no calories. No trans fat, no calories. Um, low fat, obviously no calories. Vitamin D and immunity, no calories. Um, now, I mean, you have to go into supermarkets with your thinking caps on, and you're not really supposed to do that, and most people don't. Um, so the result of all of that was an environment in which um, food companies flourished and had to just expand very rapidly. And from 1980 to about 2005, the percentage of the food dollars spent on food outside the home increased uh, by quite a lot. It more than doubled. And the... Um, the reason for that was that food was very cheap because there was so much of it around, twice as many calories as anybody needed. A lot of that was fast food. And the calories in food outside the home are higher than the calories in food prepared at home. Um, also, food appeared everywhere. Uh, I live in New York City, and all of a sudden, uh, drugstores have turned into grocery stores. I'm now buying all my milk at my local drugstore because uh, it's convenient. If you go to a bath shop, it's got um, food everywhere, and Staples, the uh, business supply store, has a section for office snacks. Uh, the more food that's available, the more gets bought. Um, the biggest thing that has contributed to uh, increased calorie intake is large portions. And um, I'm going to show some work that was done by a former doctoral student, Dr. Lisa Young, who, who uh, studied the introduction of large size portions into the food supply. The arrow on this slide points to 1980, and you can see that. Uh, there, that prior to 1980 or so, there weren't very many large size portions and they started getting bigger and there's more and more and more of them. And large size portions have gone up in parallel with the number of calories in the food supply and with rising rates of obesity. Now these are correlations, not causation, but my secret suspicion is that you don't need anything more complicated than large portions to account for why people are gaining weight. Um, and uh, some of that I can show you. This is Lisa Young, now Dr. Lisa Young. And um, she, this was at a talk that she gave in which she was showing uh, mostly some uh, soft drink cups that she bought at a local movie theater. The white one on the far left is an 8-ounce standard serving size for soft drink. It's the Department of Agriculture standard serving size. It holds 8 ounces and about 100 calories if it doesn't have too much ice in it. The double gulp on the right, um, if it doesn't have too much ice in it, it holds 64 ounces and 800 calories. 
trees. And the research shows that that large cup is not, in fact, passed down the aisle and shared among family members. It's uh, consumed by one person. Now, if I had one thing that I, a concept that I could convey to absolutely everybody, it would be that larger portions have more calories. Uh, I can hardly say it with a straight face, um, but it's not intuitively obvious, and that's been shown by a researcher at Cornell, Brian Wansink, who does wonderful experiments that are really a lot of fun. And this is a slide that summarizes his famous Super Bowl experiment, in which he invited his own students to his house. I bet that's my phone. Um, his own students to his house to watch the Super Bowl. And he put half of them in one room with four quart bowls of snacks and the other half in another room with two quart bowls of snacks. And at the end of the Super Bowl, he simply counted up how much they had eaten. And these were his own students, and they had been trained to know that larger portions induce people to eat more and also to underestimate the number of calories, and they fell for it anyway. Um, so the ones with the two-quart bowls uh, ate roughly half of what the ones with the four-quart bowls did. And when he asked them, how many calories do you think you ate? They underestimated the amount that they were eating by a much, much larger percentage. So calories, so large portions do three things. They have more calories, they induce people to eat more, and they induce people to underestimate how much they are eating. As I say, I think large portions are a sufficient explanation. Uh, let me say, give one other reason why people are eating more, and that has to do with low prices. It's very hard to argue against low prices for food because low prices mean that everybody has access to food. Um, but there's some very odd things about the way foods in the United States are priced. If you go to McDonald's with $5, for example, you could buy five hamburgers and one salad. What's that about? That's about federal policy that makes the cost of some foods cheaper than others. And if you, if poor people think that fruits and vegetables are expensive, or if you think that fruits and vegetables are expensive, it's because they are. Uh, the Department of Commerce has done studies of the index price of fruits and vegetables starting in that magic year of 1980. You might wonder why 1980 was a magic year. It's the year that President Reagan was elected. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's a coincidence. The, um, the, the price of fresh fruits and vegetables has increased by about 40% since 1980, whereas the price of beer, butter, and sodas has gone down by 15 to 30%. Um, so, yes, fruits and vegetables are more expensive, and again, that has to do with federal policies that make the costs of uh, some foods higher than the costs of others. So, all in all, we have this um, situation in which the government and the food industry and lots of other people are sort of, um, I would say, not conspiring, but collaborating either uh, intentionally or unintentionally to um, uh, encourage people to eat more. So that's our, that situation, and what that means is that we live in a food environment that encourages us to eat more than we either need or uh, hopefully want. Well, I don't know about want, but certainly more than we need. And in this kind of environment, eating less and eating better and exercising personal responsibility uh, is very, very difficult. In fact, it doesn't stand a chance with most, with most people. Um, so this was the kind of thing that induced a colleague um, in Boston and I to write an editorial for the Journal of the American Medical Association a few years ago, asking the rhetorical question, can the food industry play a constructive role in the obesity epidemic? And we kind of voted no. And we voted no not because people in the food industry don't want to be part of the solution or part of the problem, it's they can't. That the business imperatives that are involved in growing your business every quarter uh, mean that industry goals must be focused on, uh, on that kind of growth, whereas public health goals are really quite different. They're to make people healthier. Uh, so that's the reality of the situation. Um, and so what do we do about it? Well, 
Uh, what that means for me in thinking about it is that you can't really expect food companies to take meaningful voluntary action in producing healthier products or in helping people eat less if it's going to affect their bottom line. Therefore, we need regulation. And what we're seeing now in recent years is more and more kinds of regulations being introduced here, there, and in other places. Um, and studies are being done to see whether they work or not. And the preliminary research is showing that almost any regulation is uh, proving to be effective. And in fact, the American Heart Association has come out with a very, very long list of various kinds of regulatory actions that have some evidence for their efficacy in helping people eat less or eat better. On the education side, they talk about menu labels, uh, various kinds of media campaigns, and color-coded food labels, like the ones that have just gone into uh, into uh, action in Great Britain. And it's going to be very, very interesting to see how those work. Those red, red green, and yellow uh, signals on food products, some evidence suggests that people buy less of the ones with the red signals. Uh, the food industry doesn't like them very much. Um, there have been bans on trans fats, bans on toys with, with kids' meals, uh, attempts to restrict fast foods and sodas in schools. That's what the competitive rules that the USDA came out with this morning are about. Uh, attempts to prevent marketing to kids, to cut down on TV time, uh, to reduce portion sizes, and then various kinds of taxes and uh, subsidies. And all of these have shown, uh, there are studies that show some kind of of, um, of effort. Probably the most um, important leadership in this area has been leadership taken by Michelle Obama, uh, whose Let's Move campaign started a few years ago. And I have to say, for me personally, it was just absolutely thrilling to see somebody at the level of the White House who's interested in the same kind of issues that I am. I mean, I was just kind of, I was kind of amazed. And I thought that her choice of Places where she was going to focus her effort were very, very thoughtfully and wisely chosen, and that was to try to do something about food standards in schools and improve school meals, and then to improve the access to healthier food in inner cities. Both of both of those, I thought, were very smart choices, um, and she actually had some wins, particularly early on. Uh, the real, the most impressive win of the Healthy Hunger, the most impressive win of the Let's Move campaign, I think, is the passage of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010, which authorized the Department of Agriculture to set standards uh, for food served in schools, all food served in schools. Um, it took, uh, that was in 2010 and it's 2013. The rules have just been, the final rules have just been proposed, but whatever. You have to be patient. Food companies spent $5.6 million on lobbying against the school food standards. I don't think they're finished with it yet. Um, but they uh, didn't get too far on it. And when they didn't get too far, they, got, they went to Congress. And Congress intervened. And this was the famous business where the Department of Agriculture's rule on uh, the amount of tomato sauce on pizza that could count as vegetable. It wanted to eliminate that. Con Congress uh, essentially passed a law that said that the USDA could not restrict the amount of um, anything about tomato paste and puree based on its volume. And it also passed a law saying that the Department of Agriculture could not restrict the number of times that potatoes are served at school lunches during the week. Um, I thought this was astonishing micromanagement of Department of Agriculture regulations. Um, and I, I, my guess is that uh, the government had no idea what the extent of pushback would be on these kinds of regulations that are trying to make school food healthier. Well, these are the new standards for competitive foods in school meals that, can, that were issued this morning. Uh, you want to look at the bottom line, at the numbers in the bottom line. Those are empty calories. That means sugar, mostly. 
Um, and there's so there um, the the snacks that are going to be allowed are things like peanuts, popcorn, low fat this, um, healthy that. There can be uh, fruit cups, but they have to be juice. Basically, the standards have been set so that. Uh, sugary drinks are out of schools, except unless they have 40 calories or less in eight ounces. Uh, this excludes Gatorade and sports drinks. So I think the effect that this is going to have, I'm guessing that this is going to have two effects. One is that uh, food companies are going to lobby up the wazoo uh, in the next months. The, the, these rules are interim rules and they're subject to uh, comment to, to a, another comment period, and my guess is that we're going to see a lot of lobbying about this. The other effect is that the um, drinks that will be sold in the schools will drop down to meet the standards. So um, we'll we'll start seeing products with 40 calories in 80, in eight ounces. Um, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent, we can argue about. But but this really opens up the possibility of cleaning up the mess that school meals have been, and uh, I'm for this. I, I think this is really a big step forward. Um, Mrs. Obama also took on something that was much, much more controversial, if you can imagine, and that was she attempted early on to do something about marketing to children, and she gave an absolutely extraordinary speech to the grocery manufacturers of America. I thought this was astonishingly courageous, in which she made these statements, we need you to entirely rethink the products that you're offering, the information that you're providing about these products, and how you market Market these products to our children. Uh, absolutely amazing statement. Um, and what that did was to lay the groundwork for an interagency report um, on making recommendations for nutrition standards for food marketing to children. And the four agencies were the CDC, the FDA, the USDA, and what's the other one? I can't read it. Uh, anyway, there were four federal agencies that did this. Um, and these were for voluntary guidelines. And the lobbying and opposition was absolutely overwhelming. Um, so that Congress again intervened and Congress said that they could not issue this report without doing a cost-benefit analysis. This is for voluntary guidelines, not even mandatory, voluntary. Um, so that was the end of any attempt to try to regulate marketing to children, um, but good try. And who knows, maybe there'll be another administration that can do this. I live in New York City and I want to talk about Mayor Bloomberg's 16 ounce soda cap. Um, because I think it's an object lesson in food politics that is endlessly fascinated, at least I'm totally fascinated with it. So here's Mayor Bloomberg, a, a multi-billionaire, um, in his last term of office, who really doesn't care what anybody thinks about him. He's quite impervious, posed behind um, soft drinks and the amount of sugar that they contain. Uh, the 16-ounce soda cap was based on a great deal of research. Um, and that research has been published in peer-reviewed journals by multiple investigators, some of them at Yale. Um, and that research suggested that soft drinks are very, very closely linked to causing to causation of obesity, and that the fewer soft drinks people drink, the healthier they are, and the more soft drinks people drink, the heavier they are, and especially true for children. It was also based on research that indicated that soft drink companies were deliberately targeting their marketing to the groups that were most vulnerable to obesity, meaning uh, low-income minority groups. Um, and there's a great deal of advertising and evidence that food companies deliberately target low-income minority groups. Um, and it came out of about two years um, of public health campaigns in New York City that, talk, that were focused on trying to encourage people to reduce their soft drink consumption. There were subway ads pointing out how much sugar there was. Your kid just ate 26 packs of sugar. Um, I, I particularly like the ones that you have to walk three miles from Midtown to Brooklyn to work off the calories in a 120-ounce soda. 
uh, that should sober everybody. And then the more most recent campaign was as portion sizes have grown, diabetes has grown, and other, other kinds of problems have occurred. So it was sort of a logical outgrowth of that. And the 16-ounce soda was a non-random pick. They picked it because 16 ounces is two standard Department of Agriculture servings, two eight ounce servings. It contains 200, roughly 200 calories, which is roughly 10% of uh, the average calories for a not very big person during the day. And 50 grams of sugar, I'm, I'm rounding off here, 50 grams of sugar is sort of the cut point for what all of the anti-sugar physicians are saying is the amount that you really shouldn't have any more of during the day. Even, I don't know if you're familiar with Robert Lustig's work, uh, he has a book out called Fat Chance. And if you read the book carefully, uh, he's not very worried about 50 grams a day. Anything over 50 grams a day, he starts getting really concerned about. So 16 ounces is all the sugar that you're supposed to have in a day. Um, and the idea was to make the 16-ounce drink the, the default. That is, you're given a 16-ounce drink, and that's what you order. You want to order six of them, that's up to you. But if you, usually most people would be perfectly happy to drink 16 ounces. It's two standard servings. So that was uh, the bright idea. And um, it got a lot of opposition. Oh, that's such an understatement. I don't even know how to begin to say what an understatement that is. Um, among the um, more ironic and interesting political parts of it was that um, minority groups, um, African American and Hispanic organizations, uh, came, weighed in on the side of the soda industry on this. The soda industry has had decades of ties with minority groups and immediately got them involved in what they were in, in their attempt to uh, oppose this 16-ounce soda cap, which is being treated as an enormous civil rights issue. The American Beverage Association put full-page ads in the New York Times defending self-regulation. Hey, we're already taking care of it. Uh, we've reduced the beverage calories in schools. Um, the American Beverage Association attacked the science in full-page ads. Um, are soda and sugar-sweetened beverages driving obesity? Not according to the facts, according to the American Beverage Association. My favorite was the um, favorite was the American Beverage Association hired the Center Cons for Consumer Freedom, which is a what, which is an attack dog, uh, public relations off, um, organization for the food and food and alcohol and um, cigarette industries, and got them to place this um, pretty hilarious ad in the New York Times, which are attacking the critic. And what I love about this ad, Bloomberg has a sense of humor. And he was asked at a press conference what he thought about the ad. And he said, that dress, I would never wear that dress. It's so unflattering. Now, so you have this situation where uh, you have people saying, I don't want the government telling me what to do. Um, and the soft drink industry saying, you need a 64 ounce soft drink. Um, and so people apparently would rather leave it to the soft drink industry to make the decision about what they're eating. Um, well, the soft drink industry fought back and it fought back hard. Um, and. It, um, its focus was on personal choice. Don't take away our right to make our own decisions about food. Don't let bureaucrats tell you what size drink you get to buy. Uh, join us, oppose this. They did this through social media, radio and TV ads. There were planes flying overhead with big banners, petitions. Um, my uh, one of my students went out and, in, and interviewed the people, the young people who were passing out petitions to overturn this, uh, this idea, and they were paid. They told him they were paid $30 an hour to do it. It was the best job in New York to do that. Um, there were t-shirts, there were movie marquee ads and videos, and there are, there are still trucks all over New York that have these signs. I would love to know how much the soda industry spent 
on, on opposing the 16-ounce soda cap, uh, you get some indication for what they spent to try to defeat soda taxes in New York and other states in 2008 and 9. Um, and somebody was able to get that data prior to uh, 2008 and 9. The soda industry, that is Coke, Pepsi, and the American Beverage Association, spent about a million dollars a year on lobbying um, in the year that taxes came up together they spent about 40 million dollars uh, and I would really really like to know um, so far I don't have the faintest idea how to find that out uh, there were some things about it that I just loved um, there was for example an op-ed in the New York Times by the owner of Honest Tea um, who wrote this plaintive article about how uh, the soda cap was going to hurt small businesses like his. He neglected to mention that his company is owned by Coca-Cola. So I call it dishonesty. Um, the, uh, also, all of that failed. The health, the, um, um, health agency that passed, that, that was responsible for passing the 16-ounce uh, soda cap was um, every, all of its members were appointed by Bloomberg, so it didn't surprise anybody that they passed it. And when they did, uh, the soda industry took the Bloomberg administration to court on it when all else failed, uh, go to court. And I, I thought it was kind of interesting. I mean, the cartoonists were having a field day. I don't know if you can read this. The one on the left says, limiting sugary drinks infringes on my God-given rights. And then on the right, to stick um, the government with the bill for Medicaid. Uh, so it's not as if um, these kinds of problems are unrelated to everything else that's going on. There was one other thing that I thought was pretty interesting. As the deadline approached for uh, putting this uh, the 16-ounce soda cap into effect, uh, Coca-Cola put signs up in all of the, in as many stores as it could, and somebody sent me this photograph. Um, and what I loved about it was small is big news. Uh, a 16-ounce soda is small, small. Well, 50 years ago, in the 1950s, a 16-ounce was big. It served three over ice. Um, and that, I think, is an indication of how our standards have changed for what we think is large, small, or indifferent. And I got caught up in this in a kind of an interesting way. The Daily News, that serious newspaper, um, asked me to write an editorial, an op-ed piece, on why the 16-ounce soda cap was a great idea. And all I can say is I'm just thanking my lucky stars that I was savvy enough to have as the first words in my op-ed, barring any late legal surprises, because the next day, the court threw the whole thing out. Um, and the court halted the, uh, um, it's, it's a cap, not a ban on large sodas. And the Daily News, the newspaper in which I had had my up at the day before, had this lovely cover. Um, they weren't very happy with Bloomberg's performance. They had a lot of very, very harsh things to say about Bloomberg. But, but the Daily News is kind of a schizophrenic paper. I mean, they did ask me to write an editorial after all. Um, and their editorial writer, on the same day as the Suck It cover, um, said that the judge did a huge disservice to the public. Um, and they hoped that his judicial superiors, the Court of Appeals will recognize that pursuing public health is not just rational, it's imperative. That floored me. I, you know, it's, politics makes very strange bedfellows, as they say. My favorite comments about all of this came from The Onion. Um, and more from The Onion. Um, Oh, no, the, before we get to the onion. So on June 11th, um, the 
um, Supreme Court heard the last arguments um, about the soda cap, and I attended that. I was able to attend that hearing, and I did. And I thought the judges were really tough on the city, and so I'm not very optimistic that they're going to overturn the lower court's ruling on it. Um, but I thought some interesting things came out of it, and we're going back to the onion again. Um, the onion's commentary on all of this was the opposition to the uh, soda cap was uh, proof that Americans still fight for what they believe in. Every, and the article was about how everybody talks about how Americans are so passive and aren't politically engaged. And the fight against the soda cap shows that Americans are politically engaged when there's an issue worth fighting for. So I'm optimistic that there are lots of issues worth fighting for um, and that we're um, in the middle of a food revolution that is really going to change these things, if not now, then eventually. And the food revolution is everywhere. It's the big change that when I get asked, okay, what's happened since the first edition of food politics, my answer is uh, the food movement. And the food movement, I think, is huge. It's absolutely huge. And it's unusual for a, food, for a movement. It's not like the environmental movement and the civil rights movement or the women's movement. It's different in that it's much more diverse and fragmented and not really united, except that all of the aspects of these mini movements are focused on uh, an, a food environment that's healthier for people and the planet and, and farm animals and farm workers, but everybody. So there's the slow food movement and the organic revolution and the animal welfare movement and the locavore movement and so forth. Um, and these movements are, they, they range in intensity um, from uh, food as local as you can get it um, to um, a much more hardline activist approach like um, Occupy the Food System. During the Occupy movement, there were a lot of people who were interested in food issues who were part of that, and I collected these posters. I was very, very interested in what they were doing. Um, so all in all, I think we're in a situation in which there are lots of people who are advocating for healthier food for people and the planet. Um, and there's a great deal of interest in advocating for better personal responsibility and better choices. Um, and I think that's just great. Um, my own uh, ideas about what people should be doing, or they should be eating food, not food products, smaller portions if they're worried about weight. Um, I like local and sustainable food for a whole lot of reasons. Grow your own food, cook at home, teach kids to cook. The most radical thing that anybody in the food movement can do is to teach a kid to cook. And that's going to be a lasting life skill. Um, at the same time, I think um, everybody should be advocating for uh, more social responsibility. And here, the list of ways to do that is extremely long. On the agriculture side, sustainability, food safety, and farm supports um, are places to, uh, to push local and local food. On the public health side, all the way over to public health, um, almost any of these uh, will make life much, much better for people. Um, schools, neighborhood access, the safety net for low-income people. Um, I'd love to do something about marketing to kids, and I have a great deal of optimism that we're going to get there soon. If we're going to get serious about any of these things, eventually we're going to have to look at our election campaign laws so that we can elect people into Congress who are more interested in public health than corporate health. I don't see that happening right away, but I have hopes that in the future. Uh, we need to change the way Wall Street evaluates corporations, and I'm not the only person. A lot of business people are talking about that, too, because the pressure on corporations to grow as rapidly as they do uh, puts pressure on them to cut corners, to move everything overseas, um, and has changed not only uh, rural America, but has also changed our entire manufacturing uh, industry and, and, and enterprise in ways that have not been particularly healthy for our country. 
Um, and I think we need to find ways to hold corporations accountable for what they do. Um, so these are, you know, sort of just things to think about and work on. Um, and you know, my bottom line on this is vote. Uh, vote with your fork or every time you make a food choice. And even better, vote with your vote uh, if you have that opportunity. And this is uh, the last page in my new book that is coming out in September. It's called Eat, Drink, Vote. Oh, it's another commercial. Eat, Drink, Vote, an illustrated guide to food politics, the cartoons that I showed you are all come from this book. It's 250 cartoons about food politics. It's really fun. Really fun. So I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Bound in jail.